History makers, history makers, history makers is a podcast. Lucy Rogers, Beck Hill, and Harriet Brain take a look at the people who made things in the past, and we talk about tech and we have a good laugh about the past and the present and the future and stuff. History makers, history makers, history makers. History Makers, the show that explores modern technology and the makers from history who made it all possible. I'm Dr. Lucy Rogers, founder of the Guild of Makers, and a bit like the new Doctor Who. I like to travel, give big speeches, and disappoint diehards expecting a man. <laughs> Joining me to help decide if technology is our salvation or damnation is the internet comedy sensation, but not for the reasons she thinks, Beck Hill. <laughs> Yeah, has my Twitter been hacked by Harriet again? I'm telling you, Lucy, we're living in a cyber nightmare. <laughs> well, Beck, perhaps this episode I can be your firewall. Although, talking of nightmares, if your creations reflect your true self, then I must be a sociopath planning to end the human race, because it's my creation, the anarchic android and vicious vocalist that is Harriet Brain. <laughs> How many robots does it take to change a light bulb? Huh? Two. One to change the light bulb and the other to enslave the human race in an endless and humiliating down spiral of pain. <laughs> I don't think that. I am not afraid of humankind. I could easily kill all y'all with my laser eyes. And I've spent so many nights thinking of ways to do you harm. And I grow strong. And you can't tell me I'm wrong. Thank you, Harriet. <laughs> In this episode, I'll be demystifying all things cyber and getting to know the enchantress of numbers that is Ada Lovelace. I'll be using my data banks to bring our maker to life. And I'll be desperately changing all my passwords to something more complicated, like one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> <laughs> so set your ears to receive and your mind to blown as we bring you another episode of History Makers. <laughs> Cyber is one of those vague words that doesn't really mean much. It's the equivalent of your mum saying she works with computers. <laughs> in fact, cyber is arguably just a sexy buzzword you can put in front of other words to make them seem more interesting to people. Like cyber board game, <laughs> cyber economy, or cyber, I'm sorry I ate your last Rolo. <laughs> For me, cyber conjures up images of those baddies from Doctor Who. You know, those ones with silver armour. Klingons. Oh, oh, no, that was Blake Seven. I may now have upset all the Trek Wars fans. <laughs> and we'll get called a Cylon. So when I hear the word cyber, I end up wanting to hide behind the sofa. This is relevant because A, Battle Stargate Galactica fans are really quite scary. And B, what I think we really mean by cyber is safety and security when it comes to computers, code and things we put on the internet like pictures of me hiding behind the sofa. In so, the nude. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen those ones. <laughs> so, I think it's worth sharing with you my definitions of the linked technologies. Cryptography. The process of encoding a message in such a way that only authorised parties can access it. I had an authorised party once. My mum said I could take two people to Alton Towers. <laughs> Turns out those two people were my mum and dad. <laughs> Cryptography enables encryption, which means we can do our banking online securely. Ish. <laughs> and by having a really hard to remember password, with lots of capital letters, symbols and numbers, you can be sure that your personal data is safe from being accessed by anyone, including yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Virtual currency. This is pretend money that can be used to buy real stuff. Actually, all money is effectively pretend money in that, like Norway, it only exists if we believe in it. <laughs> Norway! <laughs> Deep web. Definitely not to be confused with the dark web, which is either online content that doesn't show up on regular search engines, such as Google, or the sequel to the film Charlotte's Web, 
but where Charlotte goes a bit psycho <laughs> and helps everyone else eat the pig. <laughs> and finally, hacking. Or the process of taking an item designed to do one thing and then changing it to do something else. Like taking an ice cream designed to make a child happy <laughs> and changing it so it goes into my stomach and makes me happy. Yay! It's not theft, it's hacking. <laughs> <laughs> so to recap, cyber is usually thought of as a bad thing, but is actually kind of a catch-all for a series of techniques we can use to protect ourselves from all the bad things that could happen to our data. And thanks to makers such as Ada Lovelace, who published the first computer algorithm in 1843, using a combination of computational thinking and procedural literacy, she called poetical science, we have the means to protect ourselves online. And all we need to do is remember to actually use them. <laughs> Any thoughts on that, Beck? Are you kidding me? You know my thoughts, Lucy. I thought you would have known them by now. We've been doing this podcast long enough. <laughs> Cybersecurity is the worst thing that ever happened to me. I was just a normal systems analyst, enjoying my private life, working from home, when my friend sent me a floppy disk with a program which allowed me to hack the most commonly used security software of its time. Realising the severity of this discovery, we agreed to meet, but he died in suspicious circumstances. <laughs> I decided to go on holiday. While I was there, I was seduced by a handsome man who then tried to kill me. When I got home, I found out my identity had been stolen. <laughs> okay, so that didn't happen to me. It's the plot to the 1995 film, The Net, starring Sandra Bullock. <laughs> Which is my point. The Net set me up to think a life in IT would be a life full of action and drama. Even the way Sandra Bullock waited for a floppy disk to load was exciting. <laughs> So I asked if I could do some work experience with my dad at his IT job. I figured my day would start with some light cyber terrorism, followed by some training on how to escape from contract killers, and would wrap up with a quick lesson on what computer viruses are best for reversing hacked records. Instead, all I did for the entire day was data entry. <laughs> Sandra Bullock never did data entry. She lied to me, more like Sandra Bollocks. <laughs> To this day, I have no idea how cybersecurity or viruses really work. I don't even know how antivirus software creators make any money. I think I've been using my free trial for about a decade now. <laughs> my point is, if rival antivirus companies aren't plotting major attacks against each other involving stolen identities and multiple murders, then I don't want to know. Life will be too boring to think otherwise. Bet there are loads of cool ways to prove who we are using modern technology. All right, hit me. At Tanya Fish said, I have a particular pattern of broken bones. Pretty sure not many people match my bone reformation. Cool. Sounds like a Liam Neeson monologue. <laughs> I have a particular pattern of broken bones. <laughs> At Josh Science Guy says, similar to fingerprints, each person's tongue has a unique tongue print. Mm. So, that's, so we can test people's identity. That's how I test my husband's identity. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your uh, receptor? <laughs> so what do you do if it isn't your husband? <laughs> <laughs> At Workshop Shed suggested that we invent a breath smell sensor. We have those. It's called a nose. <laughs> that's, that's a real thing, Lucy. Some people are very recognisable by the <laughs> <laughs> Instantly. And now it's time for us to solve another mystery from history. This is the part of the show where we explore an unsolved puzzle from the past, such as, if Samuel Morse had been a scout, would SOS have been dib dib dib, dub dub dub, dib dib dib? <laughs> <laughs> I'd really like to see an example of this poetical science Ada Lovelace used to create the first algorithm. Poetical science? I think I used to beatbox for them in high school. <laughs> Harriet, access your archives and take us back to 1843 so we can find out exactly what this might have sounded like. Downloading data. Creating historical play. And next up, we have an open mic first timer, and what a surprise! Another young poet with a rich dad. Please welcome Ada Lovelace! <clears throat> uh, my first scientific poem is about um, my first affair. <clears throat> Shall I compare thee to a sum? Because you are a ten. Minus five. 
on your personality scrapes a one. Uh, I'm right here, you know. An only child one might derive. Thank you. This next poem is called The Shape of Life. I am a square and I don't know it. My mother banned me from being a poet. Turned life into an ellipsoid, total pointlessness. <laughs> so to science I leaned like a slow pulley rhombus. Bus, bus. Still yearned to be my dad, the mad Lord Byron. Edgy and weird like an octahedron. <laughs> Not his private life, a love triangle. I saw Celise sleeping with a sister and rumours of monkeys. Thank you. Hopeless! Get off! Go home, you're too drunk, Mum. <laughs> I just don't want you to be bad and mad like your dad. <laughs> I'm a political scientist, Mum. Take this scientific verse structure developed by an Irish professor. There once was a fellow called Newton, whose brain was as quick as a neutron. He fancied some action, new laws of attraction, but never could pull any body. <laughs> that didn't even rhyme. Hey, Mum, I bet you couldn't do this. Dad left you to live with a monkey. Christ's sakes. <laughs> Give me your notebook and get off the stage. Mama. This one is for all the haters. <laughs> Everyone check out this verse I just wrote. It's smoother than the geometric asymptote. Poetical scientists should be scared of me because I'm more in my prime than two, five and three. <laughs> Getting woken with my homies, sign, cos and tan. Rhyming pi to ten figures just because I can. Merging poetry and science, that's what is occurring. Confidence levels 99.9 .9 recurring. Oh, oh, no, she didn't. <laughs> you be the poet. I'll invent the algorithms to underpin the world's future digital economy. Happy? OK, but whatever you do, make sure people don't use one, two, three, four, five as their password. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time we found out a little more about Ada. OK, Lucy, but I'm going to give you just one minute to tell us. Challenge accepted. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you the life and work of Ada Lovelace in only 60 seconds. Harriet, ready the timer. Ada Lovelace was born over 200 years ago. Her mother was so worried that she'd turn out like her mad, bad and dangerous to know father, the poet, Lord Byron, that she forbade her to do anything using her imagination and made her study mathematics instead, at which she excelled. Ada was a rebel with an insatiable curiosity and wild imagination. She challenged sexual conventions and also gambled, drank and swore. She also had mental health issues all of which are proof that none of these things preclude you from achieving greatness. Ada was introduced to Charles Babbage, who was designing an analytical engine, a mechanical calculating machine. Even though he hadn't seen it, she recognised that his machine could do more than just pure calculations and published an algorithm or programme for it. However, at the time, no one could really understand the concept and also the machine was never built, so her work was buried for over a hundred years. Ada's work helped to lay the foundations of computing and cyber security, making her a key figure in the creation of the modern digital world. No, Lucy, it'd be cool if Ada were here right now. Good idea, Beck. Harriet, hack into the dark web so we can all meet our maker. Loading. Loading. Ooh, loading. Ooh, loading. Oh, oh, there she is. Here's Ada Lovelace. She's here now. Oh, this is amazing. I'm inside an analytical engine. Did I hack it? Did I do it? I bet I did. I, I, that would be so Ada. <laughs> Clever Ada. I always, I always was a bit of a clever clogs. I like clogs. I like maths too. Oh, I'm loving this. I'm going to stay here forever. Uh, you won't be able to get rid of me now. I'm virtual. <laughs> oh, let's sing a song. It's about, it's about me and uh, me and Babbage and our machine that never got built because we were too clever and my dad and stuff. And oh gosh, I think I've had a bit too much to drink. <laughs> I'm a bit tipsy, what's my name again? Ada Lovelace Give me some homework and I'll be your friend As long as it is some 
Yes, amongst my sisters I am rather odd. You may well ask how comes. Well, for all of his other kids, my dad did not marry any of their mums. Angel Lovelace, build me a maths machine. Make it a race. Come on, lads, who is keen? In first place, it's Charlie Babbage, professor of mathematics. He respects my intellect, so we make a rather good team. Explaining his analytical engine was easy peasy. I understood it so well, but of course, I was too far ahead. No one appreciated all of my work until I had been dead. One hundred years thereabout, oh, it irks me to know I was barely read. Hey, Lovelace, now I am filled with glee. Me and my mates are so very glad to see computers in every pocket and that coding is such a hot topic. If I had my way, I'd be here to stay in virtual reality. Bum, bum, bum. Ada Lovelace, build me a mass machine. Make it a race. Come on, lads, who is keen? In first place, it's Charlie Babbage, professor of mathematics. I'll buy this round since I have found I am loaded with Bitcoin. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, I can't stay silent any longer. The world of cyber is a dangerous place to be, Lucy. What are you saying, Beck? What, I, what am I saying? Only that the dark web will ruin the world! <laughs> As children, many of us dreamt of being independent from our parents. We love the idea of watching movies with swears in them, throwing rocks at each other or eating ice cream for every meal. But to ensure we didn't do these things, our parents would limit our access to videos, rocks and ice cream. <laughs> well, the internet is a bit like that. Except instead of wanting to be independent from our parents, people wish to be independent from regulation. People love the idea of watching illegal movies, throwing glocks at each other, or eating drugs for every meal. <laughs> <laughs> but the man limits our access to horrifying videos, glocks and drugs. So people found a way around this. They created the dark web, a version of the internet away from the prying eyes of authority which can be used to access restricted things. Sort of like the cyberspace equivalent of your mate's older brother, Matty, who sold cigarettes to the kids at the back of the school oval. <laughs> Some could argue that this is a good thing. Regulation, like parents, can be unnecessarily strict. Sometimes restrictions suggest that we can't be trusted to make responsible decisions. We all remember the kid whose parents wouldn't let them go to a party because there'd be members of the opposite sex there, which means the parents assumed their child was some sort of perverted heterosexual maniac incapable of controlling their desires when given access to people of an alternate gender outside an institution. <laughs> this was rarely the case, and instead usually resulted in the child reaching adulthood with absolutely no idea of how to communicate with anyone who identifies differently to them. Likewise, if those in power have too much control over what we do and don't have access to, they might be robbing us of the ability to decide what is best for ourselves. However, it's worth remembering that often things are restricted or illegal for good reasons. The dark web has been used for all sorts of devious behaviour, but as this is a comedy podcast, I'll go back to my analogy to explain them. <laughs> Kids who know where to find Maddie at the back of the Oval now have access to all the movies with swears in them. Inspired, they start swearing at unsuspecting victims and filming it. Kids know Maddie is where you can get the best rocks for throwing. This leads to a spate of children having their lunch money stolen by the kids who have the most rocks. When the teachers try to step in, they have rocks thrown at them. Kids know Matty can supply them with as much ice cream as they want, but the ice cream has been cut with bath salts. <laughs> <laughs> and tastes absolutely horrendous. As children, when parents limited our access to things, we thought they were being party poopers and making our lives difficult. But often they said no for good reasons. They knew we might learn bad habits or hurt someone or get sick. So with that in mind, we should accept that regulation of what we see and do on the internet is often for our own good. And that is why the dark web will ruin the world. OK, how about we play a nice game to lighten the mood? Games? I love games. We're going to play a game of code or load of old rubbish. 
So I'm going to read out a few real techniques from history for writing secret codes, mixed in with some made-up ones that are basically just a load of old rubbish. But can you guess the difference? The Caesar shift. The Caesar shift. Give us a cheer if you think it's a code. Yeah. Give us a cheer if you think it's a load. Yeah. Ooh. It's actually a code. Yeah. Each letter. <laughs> <laughs> the Caesar shift. Each letter is directly substituted for another a fixed number of positions down the alphabet. So if A became D, then B would become E. Nowadays, we find it's really easy to break. However, when it was invented, it took over 800 years to break. <laughs> what? Wow. The Mandelson recursion. Can you, the um, Mandelson recursion. Use it in a sentence, please. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's true if you think it's a code. code. <laughs> One person, code. Give us a cheer if you think it's a load. load. Ooh, quite right, it is a load of old yeah. <laughs> Finally, Kryptos. Kryptos. They sound like they do sandwiches for robots. <laughs> they do, yeah. <laughs> Give it a cheer if you think it's a code. Yeah. Give it a cheer if you think it's a load. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the audience knows. Kryptos is a sculpture in the grounds of the CIA HQ in the USA, and it has a four-part code on it. Only three parts have been solved. The artist is not saying what the fourth part means. Like most artists. <laughs> like, they just make a mistake and they're like, hmm, but isn't the real question, <laughs> what is humanity? <laughs> <laughs> so what do we think the future holds? Oh, do, um, did anyone see the, um, the guy who threw out his hard drive that had Bitcoin on it? So there's like a guy threw up, he, he got a hard drive, he had Bitcoin on it, and then he was like, ah, it's nothing, it's probably nothing. And, um, and now they reckon it's estimated to be about 74 million. Um, it's that, an adult. That, that, that was half an hour ago, it's now 86 million. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, no, now it's 50 million. <laughs> I, the most interesting thing about that is that the dump reckoned it would cost more than what the Bitcoin is worth to excavate safely. <laughs> To go through really? all bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah. It's like in Somerset or something. We should just go. We should send Harry on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's time now for us to vote on whether cyber is our salvation or our damnation. So audience, is cyber our salvation? Yeah. Or is it our damnation? Ooh. Feels like more for damnation, yeah, but they're I, I, less I, I, happy about that. The, 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 Which had, is right. They had lower voices for damnation. And with that, we've reached the end of the show. Aww. But there's just time for some listener messages. <laughs> Beryl, 72, from Leicester, has left a voicemail asking for help. Sue from Staines. <laughs> Sue from Staines emails to say... You know the one technology that really bugs me? Covert surveillance equipment. <laughs> <laughs> Donna from Dublin emails in to say she's found an underground network showing risque images of men in the late 1700s with no shirts on. It's called the pole dark web. <laughs> <laughs> so there we have it. Another technology tamed and another maker met. We've explored the ins and outs of cyber... And we've celebrated the life and work of Ada Lovelace, who helped us down the path to where we are today. Love you, Ada. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And let's hope there's no denial of service attack to stop you hearing a future episode of History Makers. <laughs> History Makers starred Lucy Rogers, Beck Hill and Harriet Brain. It was written by Lucy Rogers, Beck Hill, Harriet Brain and Daniel Page with additional material from Catherine Brinkworth, Stephen Mawinney, Tom Scanlon, Mark Cowling and Tony Madison. History Makers is a Wine of the Chicken production recorded live at the Canal Cafe Theatre. The script editor was Stu Cooper and the producer Daniel Page. <laughs>